Hey, what's up, mediums? It's January 5th, 2017. I'm Josh Hayes, here with my friend and co-host, Scott Moon. Welcome to another episode of Thursday Night Live. We're going to bring you some updates and news today. Um, we've got Richard Fox joining us to talk about how to write best-selling and believable military science fiction. Welcome, Richard, to the show. Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, Richard is a kind of a frequent flyer with us now. I think you've been on three shows, maybe. Maybe this is the third one. Um, so we're going to go through a little bit about what's going on with us uh, as authors this week, and then we'll get right into the topic. Scott, you've got something big going on this week. I do. I'm pretty excited about it. It's actually it's been a long journey to get my Dragon, Dragon Badge, Dragon Attack, Dragon Land trilogy completed, so... Dragonland is the third and final book in that. It's urban fantasy. It's a little different than a lot of people are seeing right now because it's not a romantic, you know, hot chick science or uh, urban fantasy. It's it's kind of some uh, adventure. It's not like Twilight. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. It would be more of a uh, um, action thriller type urban fantasy if you're interested in that. So I'll be putting more up about that, and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. So I'm hoping people will like it. The third book in the series, it's wrapping it up. Uh, that's a good feeling. Yes. I was going to ask, what what, do you, what does it feel like not being done with, finally being done with the whole series? You know, it's. I, I finished my first series uh, last fall with The uh, Enemy of Man, and that was fantastic. And then also it, it became more visible on Amazon, like magically having the series finished. I'm not quite sure how that happened. I'm hoping the same thing will happen with this one. But the sense of relief and kind of getting things done and being able to just go on to the next thing is, I don't know, I always have another project in the wings, so I'm always ready to move on to the next one. Ah, yeah. Pretty exciting. It, I mean, it was good to, when the endings finally come together, together in a book, it's like that, but times three. So, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, and you've also got um, Weapons of Earth, the audio book coming out, right? Yeah. Uh, Keith Michelson is, is working on that, so I've been listening to his audio narrative and proof listening and sending them back, whatever, very minimal corrections, I think, that I notice, uh, he puts a lot of work into those. You know, he has the spreadsheet. You go through, you check everything word by word, um, and then he changed one of the characters' voices and went back and changed all of them in the book, which uh, was a lot of work, I imagine. Yeah. So, th that, I think that's going to be a good a good product when it's done too, and I'll have the entire that entire trilogy will be on audiobook, so that'll be good. Yeah, I. Um Keith, <laughs> I keep Keith. wanting to say his other name. Yeah, I know uh, name. he uh, he narrated my uh, short story for the anthology uh, through the wormhole, and that uh, audio book is also coming out. I think next week. Uh, did a phenomenal job, uh, especially with my character named Ears. And uh, every time I listen to it, I laugh. And oh yeah, that's gonna be a favorite. I can't help but notice, Richard. Are you having a problem with your sound? Are you good? No. Can you hear me now? Yep. You still hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'm gotcha. Fine. Uh, okay. Five by five. Five by five. Uh, well, I don't have a whole lot going on this week. Um, I started reading Empire of Bones by Terry Mixon on uh, a recommendation from another reader. Um, I, th I, I think it's one of my... Um, it, I'm going to get into the series, I think. There's a lot of military science fiction out there that we're going to talk about tonight that I start reading and I, and I just kind of uh, really quickly get over it. Um, but I like the characters in this book, and I like the the ship that they have in this book is not a a typical science fiction like a starship type deal. It has kind of like a, almost a, a cramped submarine type feel. Uh, so it's it's very interesting. It's just started. I'm about twenty percent into the book, um, but uh, other than that, I'm doing some work on um, the E three project explorations, uh, the third anthology that. Um, Woodbridge puts together. I'm helping Nathan uh, come up with some brainstorming stuff on that. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know, which none of you do, Scott and I filed paperwork this morning, and uh, Keystroke Medium is now a legal company entity thing now. So so, it's uh, an, uh, an official business entity. Before it was a doing business as type of thing, and now we've uh, gone to kind of take it to the next level where we're actually going to Hopefully bring more yes. to the table. So, uh, Richard, what do you got going on this week, bud? 
I am working on the first book of my new series now that the Ember War has uh, hit book nine and that's done. And it's called uh, Albion Lost is for the Exile Fleet series. And it's, it's still military sci-fi, still kind of space opera, but a very different setting, very different characters, and a, a much better bad guy, I think, this time than, than Zaros. So, and then I'm reading uh, Nick Webb's Independence because I'm writing a uh, little novella for his Kindle World, and that should be out in April. And on, on the 17th, I have the seventh, excuse me, the eighth audiobook um, the, entitled The Crucible, is coming out, and that's narrated by the incredible Luke Daniels, and I think everyone is excited for, for that, especially a lot of people on my Facebook page, because I get messages, when's the next one coming out? Pretty often, I, and I tell uh, them. Exactly. It's funny, because I, I, I try to read your books, but then I miss Standish's voice, and I can't do it myself, so I have to go back and listen to the audio. Oh, you so, can do it. You try it harder. Yeah, I probably, I probably could, but it probably wouldn't sound very good. <laughs> uh, so moving on, there's a couple other science fiction uh, military books that are coming out. Uh, Chris Kennedy is releasing his, as I want to pronounce this right, Asburn Solutions uh, book. And Nicholas Sansbury Smith released Trackers, his post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic EMP thriller. Um, when uh, I, We're going to have Nicholas back on the show on the... 16th i think february and february he's bringing 16th. he's bringing another author of a uh, friend of his um and we're going to be talking about marketing and networking so turn in for thursday night live on that the schedule's up on our website i think if you're interested in checking it out you can um new in uh traditional indie publishing news um uh, this week it, it's only interesting when you take it into context with the the um article that blew up last week uh, with that um, writer that was talking about how indie publishing is the scourge of publishing and uh, you should never indie publish and you're an evil, evil person if you do. Um, this uh, traditional published author um, started writing traditional and then went with um, James Patterson and co-authored some books with him. His name's Carp. I can't remember his first name now. For some reason, when I copied down the information, I did not copy down his first name, but his last name's Carp. Uh, he wrote uh, The Rabbit Factory, Bloodthirsty, Flipping Out, Cut, Pace, Kill, um, and like I said, uh, as well as some books with James Patterson. And he is self-publishing now, and um, the reason he did it is, in a word, quote, marketing. Uh, he says that he can give the readers the book they want, he can write the book that he wants, and he can give it to um, them at a price that they can afford. And uh, I think that was, it's, it, it, I just thought it was interesting with all the, um, all the clash and, and, and hoopla that went on with that article that came out. There are still traditionally published authors that are seeing the value and uh, just the, straight business sense of indie publishing you can make so much more money and 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 do so much more things by yourself than you can with traditional publishing not to say that traditional publishing is all bad because some things they do are very good but there's there's an example of of the opposite of that recently and i can't remember it's very rare but the the person had decided to go traditional after being successful indie right because they just didn't want to mess with all the details because it's a lot of work um but so some people can build their platform doing the yeah indie, and then you can kind of pick or choose once you have enough of a reader base so that's another value of taking the risk yourself scott you found an article about um ebook uh ebooks and indie authors going into the to uh, 2017 right i found one that's uh by the written word media um we can put a link in the show notes and there, it was the 10 things the 10 forecasts and i'm just gonna hit them real quick because we got a lot of other stuff to talk about but not, not a lot of this is surprising. It says or predicts that ebooks will account for most of the sales in 2017. Big surprise. It said indie, author, indie authors and small press are going to dominate. Um, the part it talked about there was that given the, the size of the uh, reader base and everything and, and how competitive it is, is it's going to be important to establish your loyal reader base. Right. Talked about Amazon imprints are going to command top spots. I don't think anybody's surprised there. We were talking about that before the show. Is um, so if you can get associated with an Amazon imprint, that's probably not a bad idea. 
Uh, KU readership probably going to grow. Now, there's a couple things I'm going to skip over. Audio books they predict are going to continue to improve and grow. It says marketing is going to determine winners. So you can't just write. You're going to have to actually do some marketing, especially if you're new like like some of us. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of the same stuff. You're reading a lot of articles. There's a few other points to that. But that's a good article. I'd recommend that. That's Written Word Media. Um, go check that out if you want to read in more detail about their predictions for 2017 indie publishing. And a lot of that kind of mirrors what we were talking about last week about uh, authors right. banding together, doing marketing mm -hmm. uh, together and stuff like that. Um, uh, so you can see everybody's kind of going in the right direction, what they think is good for the indie indie publishing community. Uh, but speaking about writers, let's go ahead and move into our topic uh, about writing believable and sellable military science fiction. This is the second uh, part of our series. We're going to do a third part, ha, huh? little that Scott knew. We're going to do a third part next week with Chris <laughs> Kennedy. Uh, Chris Kennedy will be on the show next week talking about um, his version of military science fiction. We get a, a double taste on it. Josh, do you think anybody's really interested in writing se uh, sellable science fiction? Um, well, I mean, let's, is this a topic people are going to care about? Because, you know, we want to bring quality to the show. Well, I, I think it is. And I, and I think... Um, that I'll let the person who does very well in the genre talk about that. Um, Richard, you have written and finished now a nine book series, the Ember War series, and it's done phenomenally well. Um, for those that don't know or might not know who you are, would you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about the Ember War saga, and then we'll get kind of rolling on our topics. Sure. I've been writing since the beginning of uh, 2014. And I did not sell books for about a year and a half. I put out a bunch of titles. None of them really went anywhere. And then I had a, a, a wonderful mentor who said, well, why don't you try writing something else? And then a light went off because I realized that, you know, at, at the time I was writing military thrillers, historical fiction. But since I've been a year old, I've been obsessed with Star Wars and Star Trek, et cetera, et cetera. I've read all that for my entire life. And it kind of it struck me like, why the hell am I writing something other than military sci-fi, which I know so well? So right. I did um, a military science fiction kind of slash space opera series, The Ember War, which is about, you know, Earth is thinks it's alone in the cosmos, finds out the hard way it's not, and then um, uh, has to make its way, you know, surrounded by enemies and allies who don't really care for the Earth. And it's, uh, so nine books, and the last one came out at the end of November. Uh, Audio books are coming out from Podium, and uh, it's been a great ride. I've had, I've met a lot of uh, really great readers, a lot of really wonderful people. And because the, sh the, the books have been a success, I've had a lot of opportunities come to me. And for that, I am lucky and grateful. Uh, well, the series is very good. And you can just see that in the, the sales rankings. Uh, and you mentioned also before the show on, on Amazon, which is how I listen to all your books on, on Audible. Um, you can go on to Audible's new military sci-fi um, category and all your books are there in the top, right. in yeah, the top rows. Yeah, it's, it's me and all Amazon imprints in the, the one, you know, the really big icons there. So right. that, made, that made me feel special. I still have to take out the garbage, but it felt nice for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I don't, I'm going to pay somebody now to take out the garbage. You, take out the garbage. My, my yeah. wife would be like, you, know, you need to do these chores. I'm like, but I'm the number so-and-so sci-fi author on Amazon. It doesn't work. I still have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <impressed. That's> hilarious. <laughs> yeah. um, well, we have uh, uh, some some different types of uh, military sci-fi. When you say military sci-fi, it really can cover a whole uh, like a broad spectrum of things. Um, you're you specifically write um, more hardcore military with like small squad um, interactions with the, the the ground pounders, if you will, and then you have some uh, military space battles. What do you think are some of the common types of military fiction that you see uh, on Amazon today? What we see a lot of is in the, the lone spaceship that's about to be decommissioned that has to fight off the alien hordes, and uh, we, we see that a lot. And then there we do there are some uh, you know mech series, you know mech warrior kind of show uh, books. So we don't see those too often. I think right. Um, Jay Allen just had a new series of that come out, and Isaac Hook. Book, mm -hmm. his name, that's right. His uh, 
he has uh, two series of that out now. Yeah, and he's got the Atlas series, and uh, awesome. I can't remember what the other one's called, but I, I do know the other one's Atlas. Wars trilogy that he that he's yeah. got, and you know, but for by and large military sci-fi, if you have characters who are in the military in a science fiction setting going about in a you know a military manner, yeah, that's military sci-fi. But yeah. some things, you know, you, you can look and say, nah, it's not military stuff. I like Star Wars. Even though the word war is in the title, it's much more space opera than, than, than military science fiction. Aliens, plural, um, is much more sci-fi horror, even though it's full of colonial marines talking like colonial marines. And <laughs> Game over, man. <laughs> Best character ever. But, uh, and, and, um, but for a lot of military sci-fi books, you'll you'll get rewarded with some big grandiose battle at the end of uh, of what you're reading, and I think that's all. You know, if you don't have that, if you just have people in uniform sitting around talking to each other, you can't label that as, as military sci-fi. Right. It's um. So my introduction when I started reading fiction, um, and the reason I mentioned this is is in the top paragraph here of your notes you mentioned tom clancy and techno thrillers military techno thrillers my first introduction to adult fiction was the hunt for october mm -hmm. um which i read in the first edition uh hardback from the naval institute press um which was the only place that he could sell it yeah. uh, which it, it blows my mind when you when you hear all these authors that are huge names and then the only place that they could sell their books were a naval institute press blows yeah. my mind and then uh, Tom Quincy didn't start selling until someone saw a picture of Ronald Reagan carrying his book around. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. People were like, this book? What well, wasn't it? It was a picture or something in the Oval Office, and he had his book or something in the in the Oval Office. That, and that's a hell of a way to get publicity, right there. President's right. reading my book, guys. President's reading it. Yeah. No, but uh, Tom Quincy, he 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 would never served in the military, and when he put that book out, he was working as a real estate agent in Florida. And, you know, he, everything he learned, he just, you know, went to the library. And some of the stuff he put in about submarines uh, made people in the Navy awful nervous because he, he figured out some classified material uh, and, you know, worked it together and figured out something that was classified. The Navy freaks out. They go to him and like, how do you find this out? He's like, it's in the library. <laughs> <laughs> I can read. Right. Yeah. It's, it, that, in, when I used to be a military intelligence officer. We call that OSINT or open source intelligence, which is you know, where you can find most, most of what you need. Right. And so, you know, Tom Clancy managed to, you know, build a career as a military thriller, techno thriller writer um, with a library card. <clears throat> so, you know, I started off, you know, for me, for doing military science fiction, I went to, you know, I, I grew up on military bases since I was 13 years old. I went to the United States Military Academy for four miserable years. I spent 10 miserable years in the Army and two 15 month like tours in Iraq, which are also miserable. So, <laughs> so all that misery combines into writing, you know, to making it easier to write military science fiction. Right. So how, how important do we think that if you're an author who hasn't written military science fiction before, wants to start writing in that genre, how important is it for them to have their own personal life experience or to do the level of research that Tom Clancy did? Yeah, just do your homework is, right. is really what people need to do. And, because who are the readers of military science fiction? It's mostly, from what I've noticed, it's guys from about 25 to 55 who grew up on the same diet of Transformers, Star Wars, Star Trek, Battletech, etc. That you know that I grew up on. So when I, I think about you know that kind of person who's going to be the reader, and by and large they're not in the military. Right. So, so you know if you don't get the perfect thing right for the military, it's okay. You know, if, as long as you're close enough and right. you don't do anything, you know, way out of bounds, like some specialist comes up to a general and just starts talking back to him, you know, then that, that'll make which, him like, grip the chair and, you know. But you see happening sometime in fiction, you know, you'll see yeah. something like that. Yeah. And then it, that gets frustrating for me. And, you know, it's, you know, I think, you know, you, both of you, you're, you're law enforcement professionals. And if you watch something on TV, and you're just going, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, for me, you know, when yeah. I watch any kind of military movie, I'm like, what the hell are they doing? Right. You know, it's, it, it's, it's so funny because like in, in, on the movies, the FBI comes in and takes over the investigation. 
Right. But in real life, the FBI comes over and dumps it on you and says, here, take this big steaming pile oh, of food. We're gonna we don't want now. this. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, funny thing. Um, so let's stick to the topic. <laughs> well, FBI is, I mean, you can have an FBI, I mean, uh, some kind of investigator like that in your story. I mean, like uh, Tom Clancy had Jack Ryan in his. Right. Uh, the thing I like about Tom Clancy's novels is uh, that they it, it was a mix of really good military, like especially in Humphrey October, since we brought it up, where you got uh, Jonesy and the captain of the uh, Dallas uh, very good military characters. They've got good banter going on back and forth. And you've got Jack Ryan, who's a complete outsider, and he has to learn all this stuff. So um, I, I like that. Um, Jack Ryan was a Marine, correct? Yes. Jack Ryan was a Marine before something happened, and he eventually became yes. an intelligence specialist. Yeah. That's a good uh, – you know, when you talk about that, uh, he, he started out in the, in the military and then went uh, kind of civilian slash military um, government. But when you talk about character arc in a story, what what are the things that we need to look at at character arc when you start talking about military characters? It's uh, you know for for any character you need to have change. You know, a character starts off one way, then by the end of the story there needs to be something different. I mean, for uh, I wrote a military military history book uh, about the Red Baron, and you know when the book starts, he's this cocky cavalry officer. By the end of the book, he's a pilot, the most famous pilot in the world, suffering from PTSD. So, you know, there's that kind of an arc. So, you know, it's, you know, when I, when I do my outlines for, for series, I always, you know, I ask myself, how is this character going to be different at the end? And, you know, not every character needs an arc. Some people are just there to be furniture. You know, that, that one guy who's just there shouting off exposition every once in a while, you know, that, that's fine. Those characters are there. Right. And, but you know, for you know the the key characters in any series, you need to know, you know, here they are at point A. Point A, here's how they're gonna be different at point B. I, as a writer, have to get them there, and that's something uh, you know that since I'm an outliner, I work out beforehand. Do you think that in in specific to this genre, do you think that um, main characters that don't have an arc damage? the product or damage the the book that readers aren't going to come back and want to read if you've got like a really kick-ass plot and you're just pounding through it do you think that they will forgive lack of arc or what are your thoughts on that it, it depends on what kind of a story you're, you're offering uh james bond does not have an arc right the punisher oh, yeah. does not have an arc um some third character i can't remember uh, not everyone has an arc but the story that happens is so you know exciting that you know you don't need it because you know people are going to get their entertainment from the explosions and the the cool gadgets and if you know that character's you know often you know if he's the same every single time it's okay mm -hmm. but I was, go ahead yeah i was going to say I, my my first thought was james bond as a character arc but you love james bond movies and uh, indiana jones um, most any action thriller, it's not really dependent upon their character is in their internal change they more have external situational and they have an internal tension, I guess, but you can live without it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the, the Hammer Slammers military science fiction series. And I don't know how many books that's up to, but it's a lot. And, you know, it's, it is kind of, it, it devolves into, you know, a battle of the week kind of thing. And if <laughs> that's what people are good at writing and that's what people want to read, it, go for it. You know, right. there is an audience for the battle of the week. That, kind of that brings up a good point. If you're going to write a long series... And your character is going to change. How much do they change each book? Do you, do they do they backslide? I mean, how do you how do you uh, ration that out so that they have something for the whole series, or do you it, just kill them off when they? No, if for me, it's I you know I have a, a bunch of characters, and then each book, you know, maybe one is having more of an arc than another. You know, and that he's going through a lot more change. Like for the Ember War, I had these this alien race called the Caragol, and when we meet them, there's four left. And, you know, they think that they are, for, yeah, they are the last of their species. And as things go on, they find out, oh, no, there's more. And then they have to rescue the people who are left. And then, you know, and then it's kind of, and then the way their arc worked is they kind of petered out before the very end of the story. So, like, the last book or two, those characters don't have much to do. Right. But that's okay, because other characters, their arcs are coming up during those last couple of books. So it's always, you know, there's always, someone is having a significant emotional event in every book 
So, but it, it, and it, and you mentioned that, and it's and and that's that's very cool that you brought that up because you see uh, after the Gardens of Nibiru, which was one of my favorite books this year, um, you see uh, Steuben and um, uh, I should know this. <laughs> uh, Not Rochambeau. Rochambeau. Uh, yeah, it's Rochambeau. It's Rochambeau. Yeah. Uh, you see both of those. They have a uh, up until that book, they have a very big presence, and then after that book, after they they get back from Nibiru, they have a diminished presence in the books. But it makes sense. You're not like reading it, going, "Where did they go?" Mm-hmm. Like these characters were really good characters, and now they've just gone. But there's a there's a reason for them to be less right. in the in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. Um, so characters are a big part of the genre what about technology what what are your thoughts on that it's you know if you're going to do a military science fiction series you, you need to figure out the rules before you start writing and like one question i asked myself with this new series i i thought why can't this spaceship get halfway across the universe in three seconds and you know when you ask why can't you you figure out where those uh, the limits are and then i you know that way i had to sit down i had to write out this is how people get from star to star and this is how it affects how other things work, and then, and then, and uh, also for other tech things is you know the important thing is to be consistent, because if you know if you have sound in space at one point, people are going to go, what is this Star Wars? And then, right. and then if you don't have it later on, people will notice that inconsistency. And right. and you know for writing military science fi, by and large you are writing for guys, and and uh, Patterson said this, and he said that writing for guys. Is tougher because um, men are more not likely to forgive mistakes. If you, I can you see know, that. If you do some sort of you know, consistency thing for whatever reason, the ladies are much more forgiving. And but you know, so what I do is I have a very long word document that has all my rules. This is how the guns work. This is how you know, here's the history of everything leading up until now. And then and so that way, if I had to go back and. Uh, figure something out, you know, it's all there. And But even then, every time I write a book, I end up playing a trivia game against myself, trying to remember everyone's name and where they were at a certain time. Um, so you, you kind of pinned it as having a Bible um, mm-hmm. for your work. Is that something that you sat down before writing and said, okay, I want a ship that does this, I want a gun that does this, or, or do you add to it as you write? How, how, what's your process with that? I will add to it as I write. Would I, like, for this... Uh, Exiles Fleet book series that's coming up. I figure it's going to be about five books long. So I wrote down, you know, here's what's going to happen in every, you know, all five books. You know, I know what the ending is before I, you know, I get started. So, and then I have all five books, and then I'm like, okay, here's what has to happen, the big event in each book, and then how do I get there, and then uh, then I figure out all, all the characters that, that come along. And then, you know, I know the, the muse will happen. I'll be writing, and all of a sudden this character will pop up out of nowhere. I'm like, okay. He or she can stay. So, and the, you know that's kind of how how uh, Standish happened. Is that you know I was, I was writing the first Ember War and it's heavy. Okay, spoilers. Everyone on Earth dies. <laughs> that's, that, that's heavy. Yeah. And and then you know and everyone's dealing with like everyone I know is dead. You know, and then you have someone there to lighten it up a little bit. And then right. it's like and Standish stayed. So. I also realized if I did anything to him, I, people would, would find me in the street and beat me in the baseball bat. Oh, yeah, there'd be riots for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely became a reader favorite. You know, there's – yeah, I think you, I think you'd have problems if you killed him off, especially without some kind of really good reason. Yeah, I don't oh, know. Stanish is he, – he'll survive. He's like the guy with the crossbow on The Walking Dead. Yeah, Daryl. Uh, He's Daryl. Well, I don't know. They tried to kill that Asian guy twice. I, I think know. he. I think they I got him. I watched the show, but I know they tried to kill I him twice. they got him this time. But you know that was that was a harsh. I've only watched the first two episodes of season seven, and, uh, and that's hardcore. What? Um, so when you come up with your ships, when you come up with your space technology, what do you do? You use anything as like uh, blueprints for that? Do you just kind of spitball it as you're writing? Um, do you come up with ships that are specific to what you need to accomplish with the book? It's. It, it, the ship's big enough to have everything happen on it. Like for the Ember War, you know, it's the Brightonfeld. And if it was like a little tiny little destroyer, I couldn't put in landers or drop pods or have big guns to blow up other things. So the ship was big enough to do what it needed to do. 
And for this this next series, I have the Orion, which is more of a you know kind of a battleship light, and it, it just fits. Because the way it works in, in this next series is it's a lot of you know gun lines and ships of the wall, you know, get together and they shoot lasers at each other. So ship, right. ships ships of the wall being a reference to ships of the line from old naval novels where they basically all line up form a firing line or a blockade right. or some sort of tactical. I think I got ships of the wall from David Weber, his honor Harrington series. I won't call it right. I mean I think he does something something like that. I remember somebody does that, I think. And stuff. So how do you avoid when you have all these things um, like you have a, a battleship that nobody's seen and you have this technology that nobody's uh, ever interacted with or experienced? Um, how do you get past the this is nine pages of exposition to do like a narrative summary that's not eight pages of technical specs? Right. It's um, for the for, if I tell somebody. It's a laser cannon the size of a you know of a bus and it shoots a beam the size of a car. People get it. We've seen Star Wars, we've seen Star Trek. You know we're familiar with other stuff. It doesn't you know it's not a hard sell. If I was doing something really weird, like you know it's like rail cannons are almost too far out there. But you just say it's a magnetically driven bolt that you know shoots down a you know a, a set of rails. People get it. You know, you, you know, the small thing goes real fast, hits, hits and goes boom. So, you know, by and large, readers don't need that much explanation. As long as, you know, things make sense. You know, if I'm doing something like where they're transporting cats across, you know, the, the universe onto the bridge, you know, people be like, what the hell? You know, you need I'm time. Pretty, I'm pretty sure there's a book out there that does that. I'm almost yeah. positive that there, there is. But so basically, you, you establish your universal rules for your story, your, your story universe, and then you follow them or right. stay consistent to your own rules. Right. And then it's, you know, sometimes the, like if the bad guys can, bre can bend the rules, you know, and if, you know, if they do things better than the good guys and it keeps the good guys off, you know, off balance, that's fine. Because you, if somebody is technology, technology advanced by a few hundred years, maybe they could do something like that. Right. So, so you know, you establish those rules and then you bend them when you need to have drama, you know, but, Preston Lay asks, "What's the favorite? Uh, what's your favorite tech that you've come up with for your novels?" Hmm. Oh, good question. Yeah, I really like the rail guns, and, or excuse me, the Gauss guns that the Marines are carrying. And you know, the reason I went with Gauss is that you know I just don't think if you if you're in a vacuum and you're trying to shoot something that depends on oxygen to to, to light a flare and to light that fire and then get that explosive train going, it just seems like to me like it wouldn't work. So I have the Gauss weapons, which, you know, space, ground, you know, it's just another magnet throwing something really fast. So I kind of like those. Yeah. Uh, while we're taking notes from the peanut gallery, Ralph Kern <laughs> asks, uh, with the success of the Ember War and its sheer size, are you considering releasing your notes either in wiki form or maybe a companion to the Ember War? My notes are, rich, are, are written in, in Richard's shorthand. Mm -hmm. Which make perfect sense to me, but if somebody else gets a hold of them, they, they think I'm, I might be like the Unabomber or something. Because <laughs> it's just you know, it's a lot of bullet lists with, and then like you know, in my old notes, I just have you know placeholders. You know, I right. think at one point the the, the Caragol were cat people, and I had you know cat people do this. That, and so it's um, if if Amazon ever approached me to do a Kindle World, I would I would put together a Bible. For everyone but i don't think that's going to happen just because of how linear the story is and there's not a lot of options for people to branch off right uh yeah once I mean, you blow up the earth it's it's hard yeah. to do yeah, i can't do that second. <laughs> um so you do, so with all these different books that are out there um like you've got kindle worlds with isaac hook um, like Marco Clus in his Frontline series, you've got uh, Terry Mixon in his series. Um, do you think at all that the market's becoming oversaturated with military sci-fi, or or do you think that there are still areas where people can write and succeed and get? Uh, is this a genre that people are are eating up still? It's I, I've been in the genre for about a year and a half now. And almost all the names who were there at the beginning are still there. 
there's a few new ones. Um, Daniel Aronson, yeah, he's there. Uh, Lindsay Broker, she's there. Chris Fox, no relation, he's there. And a lot of other you know people are, are coming in. And I don't, you know, the readership is still obviously hungry for for new stuff. And I think that um, most people pick up one of these books that's between sixty and ninety thousand words, and they're getting through it in you know four to five days for you know the, your real heavy readers. And then they right. want something else. So you know there there's still plenty of readers out there who are still you know waiting, you know tapping their fingers, waiting for something better, for something else to come along. I'm always impressed by readers that read a book a day and I know there's a bunch out there and they really do. They crank through them and um, it's, impre it's, it's impressive to me because I've met several people recently who, who do that and they just, they're reading. My son is one of them actually. I, I, I can't keep him in books. We learned early on that we buy him a book and then he'd come back two days later. I need a new book and we're running out of money trying to buy him that. So he's one of those, one of the target audience. Do you think that there's any, um, uh, let's just say, any type of story that's been overdone, or or that 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 you just read and it's the same, and you want something different? Do you think that's there's a specific kind of plot story that's been overdone here recently? There's there's two kinds I've noticed, and one is that that about to be a decommissioned ship gets to go fight the alien hordes, and. You know what? It's still coming out, and they're still selling well, so people like that story. Right. So, um, you know what? If people like it, there's no reason not to give it to them. And the other one is the kind of the, this quasi-hero's journey story where, you know, you have a soldier or a civilian who you know, he starts off, you know, very, you know, naive place, joins the military, and then and goes on quite, you know, quite the, you know, the hero's journey. You know, Starship Troopers is a perfect example of this. Um, Daniel Aronson's book starts off like that. Uh, Cluse's books start off like that. Uh, Isaac Cook's art, um, first book, uh, his armor, I, I keep calling them armor, but uh, start off just like that. So, and the hero's journey is everywhere. And you and you really, you cannot go wrong doing the hero's journey. Right. Um, well, it's, it's a story structure that's probably as old as storytelling. It probably started long before we had a written language, I imagine. It's, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of, of Campbell. I've got his audiobooks. I've got a couple of his books over there. And he, you know, he goes through, you know, every culture has this story. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's, it, he would say it mimics, you know, a human being's you know, journey through life. And that's why everyone likes it so much, because everyone can relate to it. So, that's all I was going to say. It's relatable. Right. Um, Preston Lay asks, do you read the same genre that you write? And if so, how do you keep that from leaking into your story? That's a question I want to hear because I've, I've met several authors that that's not necessarily true. It's kind of interesting. I, I do read, you know, I'm reading um, Nick Webb's stuff because I'm going to write in his, his genre later on. And I do try to, you know, to, 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 to not get into it so much just because of the way, you know, I don't, you're both creative types. And a lot of times creative types, you know, you'll get all these ideas through your head and you're like, that's so-and-so's idea, that's so-and-so's idea. That's my idea. And it happens. And I just, you know, and it, I would be worried that somehow something like that would, 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 would leak through. You don't want to be part of the hive mind. Yeah, and I, I read a lot of uh, Warhammer 40,000 uh, and a lot of Aaron Dembski Bowden and and their, you know, that intellectual property is very different from a lot of the military sci-fi that's on Amazon. So you know, and they they have you know inquisitors and space gods and demons in, in their books, which you know you don't see a lot of in the military sci-fi that in the genre I write. So you know, it, it's good. You know, that that's where I go to to do a lot of my reading. Uh, Chris Guillory asks, as a veteran, do you sometimes feel that you're going uh, too much in the weeds? Uh, in other words, do you have to, at times, take a step back and think of catering to a wider audience? Well, military talk is mostly, you know, the F word. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you can boil all down to different, at, at different volume levels. And um, most readers don't, don't, need that and then it's, it's entirely possible to write a perfectly military conversation that would be incomprehensible 
to the to the layman. Like, I used to be artillery, and you know when you're in the fire direction center and you're sending off command and you're working out the gun, you know how the guns are going to be laid and everything. You know, military people they hear that like, yeah, okay, I know what to do. You know, John Q. civilians be like, what on earth has happened? So <laughs> right. It's, so when I write, um, you know, for the military stuff, it, it has to be relatable to that, that wider audience. So, so if you do use jargon, say, because you're going to use some military jargon, do you just use it and not explain it? Or do you go through exposition and line it out? Or is there some sort of happy medium to get everybody I, on board? I avoid acronyms at all costs. I mean, if, you know, if for, for military folks, if I say, you know, there's a, a PBIED over there in that crowd, they understand that, that there's a person born improvised explosive device, which means a guy is wearing a bomb on himself over there. If, but I would have a character say, that guy's got a suicide vest on. It makes more sense. You know, right. That's not how you would say it. Right. It's easier. It's more consumable. Right. What, it, that's very interesting to me because you can see that. Um, uh, you, Ralph said you can see it in his copywriting too. Um, but you can see that in law enforcement and in military writing where you have – people want they say oh, i want realistic military science fiction no you don't because realistic yeah, military really. it's it's super it would be super boring so you want to stand in line a lot yeah bitch and complain a lot right and um, then yeah and it, what's interesting to me is we mentioned the f word a little bit ago um hmm. it's funny that there are so many readers i've seen a lot of reviews that are like they just curse so much hmm. But then you see like a book like Andy Weir's book and he starts off with the F word. Like that's in the first sentence of his book. And it's, and it has, I think the most reviews on Amazon and, you know, made millions of dollars and got made into a movie. Uh, but it, it's funny that people focus on those when they're just, they're just words. And, um, you know, some people, some people overuse them, you know, but if your character, if that's what they say, then you've got to go with what the character says. I stick to the, the PG-13 rule that you get one F word, but somehow the Martian had two. Anyway, so I, <laughs> I, I keep the salty language for special occasions. So right. it need to be on every single page, even though it would be with actual soldiers. I find right. a lot more of it goes into the first draft and then it gets pulled out after you've, you know, cooler heads have prevailed. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so you talk about, like who you're writing to, who's your, what's the, the demographic of people that we're trying to sell these books to? It's, it's mostly guys in their twenties to fifties. And I, you know, I look at you know, the, the, uh, a lot of people who like my Facebook page, you know, I see their, their, their profile pictures. It's them with their family. Mm -hmm. And then I've had people say, I read these books to my children and they listen to the audiobooks with their children. And I'm like, I got to change that scene. <laughs> I can't have because it's just like, oh, that's gonna be an awkward talk, and I don't want to have, you know, I don't want a, a father or, or mother to, you know, have that conversation. Maybe they're yeah. listening to one of the audiobooks on a drive or something. We used to do that yeah. in my family. So yeah, so it's, so I mean, it doesn't mean there's, you know, I'm gonna tone. I mean, I won't put anything extreme in, even though it's entirely pop. I mean, if somebody gets eaten by an alien, you can get awful graphic, or right. you can just come across the remains later. People get the idea. It's uh, and and in this genre, you, like you say, you have to be you have to be careful about how you do it because it's not like this genre is different from say Game of Thrones genre where it's like super grim dark fantasy. Those people know what they're getting into in that genre. They know that entrails are going to be dragged all over the floor and people are getting raped and killed and all that. That that they go into that book knowing. So is that it, what you're saying is when you come into a, a book in this genre, military, sci-fi, space marine, or space fleet, or however what you want to put your book in, um, there's got to be some barriers where you're not, you've got to keep it consistent with the the material that's already out there or it's going to flop. It's, you know, you know, mixing the genres would be a mistake. And, you know, for whatever reason, if you go to the military sci-fi, there's a lot of, uh, erotica books featuring aliens. And I don't know how they get in there, but that's not really military sci-fi. <laughs> are reading. Could be. It could be. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I don't think they're reading for the erotica experience. I don't think they're reading for the horror experience. I don't think they're reading for, you know, the, 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 the Wikipedia in book form experience. 
You know, right. people who want to go read military sci-fi, they're expecting a battle. You know, they're right. expecting a lot of fighting. They're expecting, you know, that vicarious experience of being a space marine on Klendathu, you know, shooting at bugs. So that's that's the kind of, you know, that's what people want. That's what you should give them. And if, you, if people come in to, you know, come into my pizza place and I say, here's a hamburger, they're going to leave. So... <laughs> Man, that's a really that's a really good analogy. I like that. That is a good one. So when we're talking about writing military science fiction, what we've talked about what we want to put in. Let's talk about some of the actual um, the the um, the process. So we'll, we'll talk about length and um, price and how you're going to put this series together so people are going to enjoy it. What do you recommend? It's um, well, I always say stories should be as long as they need to be. Okay. And, but, the, but if you have something less than 40,000 words, don't call it a book. Call it a novella, call it a novelette. And the only reason 40,000 words is that cutoff is because of The Great Gatsby. It's 40,000 words, and no one will say that's not a book. So, um, but, you know, generally my books are between 65 and almost 80,000 words. And I charge between three ninety nine and four ninety nine for that. Uh, no one's complained. About that, and for, then, you're talking about for an ebook is three ninety nine to four ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, paperbacks are a little different because there's a lot of extra costs that go in there, and you have to uh, adjust accordingly. Right. So, but you know, the majority of my sales are ebooks. And go ahead. I was just going to ask you with those books. Do you have a perma-free, or do you make collections, or specifically when we talk about the Ember War series, because that's that's your mainstay series. Uh, what? How do you how do you manage that series? It's everything is in uh, Kindle Unlimited, and so you know, so everything's going to be on Amazon. It's not going to be anywhere else. Uh, the first book is at three ninety nine. I put it at two ninety nine. It sold the same as three ninety nine. So. You know, it makes sense to put it at three ninety nine. And then for for us as as writers, um, if you put yourself in the, in the reader's position, a ninety nine cent book a lot of times is a red flag, unless it's coming to you through BookBub or some other ad site, letting you know that this ninety nine cents for a little while, you know, then it's like, oh, then this is probably still worth it. But a lot of times people look at a ninety nine cent book and think, what's wrong with it? And right. uh, perma free is not very common in military sci fi. It's, uh, it just it just isn't so I don't I don't I don't go with that now, um, but for you know I did put out one uh, omnibus for the first three books, and it's still there and I, I have not broken the code on how to do that right yet. So and so is the omnibus for, not selling as well as the individual individual books are? It it is not, and I think and you know when I went to my mailing list, I said, hey everybody got an omnibus. You can get these bonus short stories, which you should have, already have anyway, 25% off. And I was marketing it to people um, who, who probably bought those first three books a year ago. Ah. And, and anyone who's been reading my stuff, they're through the first three books. Right. So, that's, that, as soon as you started, I was, that's what I was going to say, is that when people lock into your series, they're probably going to buy one, two, and three right off the bat. Right. You know, click, click, and click, and then... And a lot of people, you know, they've read all nine books. And it's like, I don't, why should I care about the first two books? I already have them. So it's, uh, that's one thing you do. Now, Isaac Hook, he is a smart man. And let me tell you what he did. He wrote his second, uh, his Alien War trilogy, which, uh, which has his characters from, uh, from Atlas. And he wrote those books in advance. And he put them out one after another. He, you know, like one book came out in, let's say, September. Next one, October. Next one, in uh, November, which is a brilliant marketing move because Amazon loves that, and the yeah. algorithms, you know, really, you know, start pushing all those books to people. And then, you know, for as for as voracious as readers, military science fiction people are, you know, they get done with that first book, you know, well within a month, and oh, here comes the second book. And you know, for me, and I think uh, Jay Allen was talking about this, you know, uh, if I was waiting to come into to the genre. And if you have the time and you know the, the the money to get all three or four books done and then have them come out month after month after month, is a much better move than putting one book out and then seeing how long it's going to take you to get that second book done. Right. You know, if somebody puts one book out and it's a hit, and then it takes you four or five more months to get that second book out. 
you know, your audience has, has moved on. And I think I already know the answer to this question because we've talked about it. But uh, so how do you feel about pre-orders? Uh, put your book up for pre-order. Here, here's, I, I put one book up for pre-order and they got a thousand pre-orders. That was nice. Um, but here's the thing with Amazon. You put your book up for pre-order and it gives you one push. And it tells everyone who's, who's, who's following you, here's this book. It's up for pre-order. Um, but they can't look inside of it. They can't read it. And then if they choose to buy it, then they just get the book, you know, the day it comes out. And then when the day the book comes out, Amazon doesn't do anything for you. So I find it better to put a book out, and then when people find out, oh, the book is out, they can look inside, they can buy it right then, instead of, oh, it's out. Well, I'll, re I'll try to remember in a month when it's published to see if it's worth buying. Right. So it's kind of that immediacy of, oh, it's here now, let me get it. Instead of... It's here now. I'll think about it, and maybe I'll remember. So you mentioned having your third book at, at two ninety nine or three ninety nine. Jr. Hanley asks about the ninety nine cents um, introductory book in this series. You don't you you think that people will go into the two three ninety nine bracket without the the ninety nine cent introduction? I, I certainly. I mean, there's a lot of new books that come out there that launch at three, four, you know, sometimes five ninety nine. I wouldn't push anything but past 599 but I mean I see what a lot of people do Daniel Aronson comes to mind he puts his new stuff out of 299 keeps it there for a month or two and then you know and then he then it'll go back up later so I mean that you know that, that barrier of 299 to 499 is not too much when you know Starbucks for Christ's sakes five bucks yeah or just one of those yeah. guys. so right. You know, and, and I think I read somewhere that it's like from four ninety nine to five dollars, people are going to be like, "Well, let me think about this." You know, for a lot of people, it's that two ninety nine buy versus the four ninety nine. They're almost the same. So, you know, it's, do you think that ninety nine ninety nine cent books are more of an impulse buy? You might grab some of the impulse buy people, as to for as with the more regular price books, you're getting people who actually want to read the book. It's you know, for me, if I pay. Like for uh, Warhammer, they put their stuff out at fifteen ninety nine on their own website, and there are some authors for, for an ebook. For an ebook, I'm not making that up. They're, they're awfully cool. proud of their ebooks. Yeah, and well, they, they know their audience. And right you know, like for me, Dan Emmett has a new fourteen ninety nine ebook. I'm going to buy it, and I'm going to read it right then and there. And then if it's some other story I'm really interested in, if, if, gosh darn, if I paid fourteen dollars for that, I'm reading that tonight. And right. uh, good point. And if uh, you know, for a longer series, I want people to read the books because they're not going to, you know, if it's just to pick up the first book and if it gets thrown in the pile, the 99 cent books I got, I'll get to it later, baby, pile, then they're not going to get to the next eight books versus, you know, here's this great book. It costs three ninety nine. Read it now. And then they read that now. And then they, you know, at the end of my books, I put in a sample chapter for the next book with plenty of links to go buy the next book right then and there. So... You know, because I want people to read all nine books. So, so when you, uh, this question also comes from J.R. Hanley. Uh, say with your first book, um, you when you published it, uh, the Ember War book, um, you already had some kind of a track record when you come from the Red Baron and the other books that you read or writ, wrote. Uh, Go for, for it. A, say man. It. Ah. <laughs> so for authors that don't have an audience uh, mm -hmm. or that don't have uh, the fan base to carry through, do you, do you still recommend doing the 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 two ninety nine three ninety nine price point? Do you think that that a one ninety nine or a ninety nine cent price point for a new author in that would be a good idea, or do you still say go yeah. for the two ninety nine? If you put it out at two or three ninety nine, it's it says confidence. It says this book is worth you know your four dollars. Versus the 99 cents of please is how, you know, just kind of how I look at it. And it's, you know, if, if an author comes out, you know, like, it's great, you know, versus mom loves it, you know. Have, <laughs> you know we, we authors, you know, we tend not to, we tend not to, you know, have a lot of confidence about our stuff. Mostly because we spend all day thinking we're horrible. And right. when it's time to market, yeah. it, when it's time to market, it's time to buck up and say, this book is good, it's worth your time, it's worth your money, here you go. So, right. That's a good point. You know, marketing is not the time to be uh, a wallflower. So we talked about the, uh, getting people into the first book and the price points. 
Um, do you have any tips on getting people to carry through the series when you, um, and I know that we, we put in here when, uh, and I'm actually very guilty of this, putting in the, the to be continued at the end of your book to, I was going to make people. a joke about that, but you already stole my thunder. Like, yeah. Anyway. Oh no, I knew you, I knew it was coming. I knew, I knew yeah. it was coming. What, so what do you think? I mean, we would talk about the whole book story from for one book and then continuing into the next book to, to bring people through the series. What are your what are your thoughts and tips on that? Here's how I look at it, is that every book has to an, ask a question. And then in that book, you need to answer the question for that book. Like the second book in the series is called The Ruins of Anthos. And by the end of the book, you knew what was there. You, know, you knew you know, there's some freaky space god that was hiding underneath a, a pyramid. So and then they leave. Now, but by at the end of that second book, you get the question for the third book, and you find out you know this this planet is under attack, and the Brightonfield has to go over there and, and rescue them. So, you know, the people who read the book they got a complete story, and now the question is asked for that third book, and so those readers should be thinking, well, I want to know what happens in that that next book. So it's not so much a cliffhanger as it is, you know, you, you here's another problem that we have to go solve. Gotcha. And, if, gotcha. and if you do that for every book, and people will be like, okay, I want to go find out what happens next. Right. And right. if you have like a real definitive closure point, people might leave the series because they're like, I got enough. You know, they the bad guy was dead. And it's, have you ever seen um, Castle? Yes. There's, the series should have ended when Beckett arrested the guy that, that, that murdered her mother. Spoilers. But it went for two more seasons and it was horrible. So, Right. You, know, you always have to have, you know, that, that one thing that people are like, I still want to know what happens next. So now I did end, end a book on a to be continued once. And that was, you know, it was a good point. It's at, you know, the end of the siege of earth, which if you listen to the audiobook, you kind of know what happens. Right. And, you know, I made people wait like 10 weeks for that next book and people were grumpy. And, you know, <laughs> but for people who are just starting the series, they can just motor right on through. Oh Yeah. Yeah. The next book is right there for them. So, yeah. um, Ralph Kern asks, what are your thoughts on joining Nick, Nick Webb's Kindle worlds? Yeah, you know, I can't wait. To, you know, I, I've been bad. Um, I really do want to write for this and, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, you have a, a very good story that works well in his universe. It doesn't work well for anything else I have, but the way, Next series, you know, the way his bad guy is, I have a, I have a thing that will work. So I'm, I'm glad that I had this opportunity and hopefully people will like it. Excellent. I'm going to bet. Yes. But I hope so. Um, well, we're coming to the end of the hour and this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, thanks everybody for hanging out with us in the chat. Uh, I had a lot of fun reading everybody's, uh, comments and questions. Uh, Richard, can you tell uh, the viewers and the listeners later uh, where we can find information about you and your Ember War saga? I, I go to Amazon and type in Richard Fox Ember War into that little search box. Everything will come up. Um, if you want, come to Facebook, Richard Fox Author. Uh, come say hello. And that's really the two best ways uh, to meet me Amazon and Facebook. Awesome. Uh, well, for uh, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this episode on writing military science fiction. Like I said, we'll be back next Thursday with Chris Kennedy with uh, the third part to the military science fiction genre writing school, if you will. Um, on Monday, Michael Anderley will be here. Uh, that will be a really fun episode, I think. And um, I really, en I really enjoyed. Uh, talk is I, I love this genre and I can't wait to, to start getting uh, neck deep as it were into my uh, military science fiction series um, for everybody that is writing in those series um, you can send us comments on our Facebook uh, group it's a uh, keystroke medium search in Facebook uh, if you have other questions that you would like us to ask uh, Chris or questions that you want to ask uh, Richard that you weren't uh, didn't have ready or didn't get a chance to ask tonight put them in the Facebook group and we'll try to get them answered for you uh, Scott any last thoughts yeah I just think it'd be it'd be great to see some more people on the Facebook page um, it's a good place to get some interaction we can start uh, putting those questions to you know to Richard and to other guests 
so we can kind of see what some topics are and what's interesting. We'd really like to direct the show to what people want to see and what they need to know. So give us some feedback there. We need a couple more subscribers to break 100. That's right. Um, so that's coming along real nice. That's right. All right. Well, uh, everybody, thanks for hanging out with us. I am Josh Hayes for Scott Moon. We are Keystroke Medium. Uh, make sure you come back next week and join us on another episode of Thursday Night Live. Have a good night. <laughs>